Welcome back, dear viewers. As part of the celebrations, which uh, uh, we are celebrating the anniversary of the monumental discovery of uh, Tutankhamun's uh, tomb. Uh, dear viewers, in this discovery, is over 150 objects found in the pharaoh's tomb are on a world tour. Dear viewers, we are honored to host our distinguished guests. Uh, Bassem Shamea, uh, of course, uh, researcher in the Egyptology and senior tour guide. Tell us more about the significance of this very special occasion, which we're celebrating from a very special place, which is the, of course, Egyptian Museum in Cairo. In Cairo. Uh, very good day, sir, and it's a pleasure always to have you with us in Nile Cruise. Thank you for having me, and what a great occasion, and what a great place in the Egyptian Museum, especially if it's the new scenario and the new exhibition, the way how they are exhibiting things. I'm so thrilled and as if after 40 years I'm seeing the museum in a different outfit which is adding to more excitement. Sir, after uh, this year marks 100 years since the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun. Would you tell us more about the pharaoh and how this tomb was discovered? Well, Tutankhamun actually as hieroglyphically correct is Tut Anch. Imen. Imen, of course, is the invisible. This is in hieroglyphs, means the invisible, as the sun deity. And Tut is a hieroglyphic word for the image. Anch is alive. It's the living image of the sun. So the name itself is very impressive. A king who is pretty famous, but very less is well known about him. And this is something that we are learning in Egyptology each and every day. The most famous names are the most ambiguous. Khufu, very famous, very little is known about him. Tutankhamun, pretty famous, 5,000 more artifacts found in the tomb. On the 4th of November 1922, 5,398 pieces in one of the smallest tombs in the Valley of the Kings question that comes to your mind directly if one of the three smallest tombs in the Valley of the Kings has got over 5,300 pieces so how about the big ones like for example how many pieces in the big ones exactly so we are talking multiply this or triple that so the man took the power when he was only eight or nine he died 18 or 19 and uh, according to my last study paper I decreased one year of his life to become uh, dead 17 uh, How did you decrease one year of his life? There was this, and still, very famous steel, a very famous uh, stone tablet with a writing on it, very rare. And uh, it was in the Louvre Museum and then it moved. And from the text, I started to make a little bit of calculation. Now, here is an interesting thing for you to think about and for our dear viewers. When you open the tomb, or when you study the mummies and all the artifacts, you will notice that Tutankhamun had garlands and had lots of seeds. We had dome fruits. We have seeds of watermelon. We had sesame in the tomb of Tutankhamun. And by the way, one of the most ancient occurrences of sesame in ancient Egypt was in the tomb of Tutankhamun. The only country which was known of sesame was India, and that made some historians try to link a trade relationship, can you believe that? A trade relationship between Egypt and India due to sesame. So very small, minute little things can change chapters of history. So I took some of those flowers study, and I thought if those flowers were used as a garland, so let us see those flowers, when do they blossom in Egypt? And that will give us when did he die and when he was mummified. And that was a study made and I continued it, number one. Number two. When do they blossom, sir? They blossomed, some of them, in the summer. And it would take him 70 days for mummification. You calculate that. And from there, with a little bit of complications, I dropped uh, one year. Interestingly enough, for years, again, year 2022, for years, historians were trying to prove if Tutankhamun was a warrior. And that was never proven. Now, here comes Mr. Historian Bassam, and he thought to himself, well, let's take a look. We found a shielded outfit used. 
And this shielded outfit was to be used by Tutan Khimen during war. Proof number one that he went through war. Number two, his depicted scenery on chariot wheels with his bow and arrow, and right behind him, the platoons of the Egyptian army. While I'm looking, I thought there was a certain flower, it's the amber flower, but I didn't know the amber flower. So I called an expert in the University of Cairo, Dr. Reem, and I told her she's an expert in historical plants. Can you imagine the speciality? And I told her, what is this? She goes, that's amber and that's dome palm. So from the flowers, you would know where the battle took place. So all sorts of things like that. So I'm trying to tell you here, after all of this, is that after 40 years of me reading history, I'm still finding new things in 2022, matching with the 100 years uh, celebration of the tomb of Tutankhi. Okay, uh, look for... Uh, is one of the very important places which held this celebration to mark this occasion. Could you tell us more about the celebration, sir? The River Nile divides Luxor into West Bank and East Bank. The East Bank is well known of the Karnak temples and the Luxor temple and the Museum of Luxor. And the West Bank is well known of the Valley of the Kings, Valley of the Queens, Valley of the Nobles, Valley of the Workers, Asasif, lots of cemeteries, Drabu, Naga, Khokha, places. One of which in the Valley of the Kings is the tomb of Tutankhamun, which was excavated by the young Hussein, who was 12 or 13 years of age, who was the water boy of the excavation workers. Howard Carter wrote in his book, in his uh, diaries, when he went into the Valley of the Kings that day, the 4th of November, he found the workers looking at him, and uh, he thought something happened. But unfortunately, Howard Carter did not write the name of Hussein, the young child, Luxurian child, who found the first step. 16 steps leading to the rooms. Now, what is so strange about this tomb? One, very unique, very strange. Number one, one room only is painted in colored scenery, something that we are not used to in the Valley of the Kings. Number two, no carvings on the walls, but drawing. And that, to me, as a person who reads history, gives me and spells to me that there was no time. There was no time to carve, so we'll have to paint. Three, we found, and if you look at any of the pictures today, you will find black spots splashed all over the scenery. And that, the historians told us, that it was the air and the oxygen and the nitrogen and the carbon dioxide in the air made some chemical reactions with the colors which was still wet when they were closing, meaning that the colors itself was done in a hurry. Number three. Number four, are you trying to tell me that a man who took the power when he was eight or nine died 17 and they achieved 5,398 pieces and they are all masterpieces? Not one is like the other in a, fair, in a way of comparison. So how come? And that is the question that we are still trying to prove uh, its answer till today. And finally, we are talking about the death. How did he die? That's another very big question. Did he fall off a chariot wheel, as they said? Was he during a hunting picnic and he fell and he died? Was he suffering from malaria? We went even to some sublime, from the sublime to the ridiculous theories of he was run over by a hippopotamus. Can you imagine this? This is one of the uh, theories. I believe in one sentence that he was assassinated. And that's a whole another episode that we can discuss this. But the proofs that I found, um, especially a lesion on his cheek, a lesion means he was kind of wounded, but the wound did not take its time to mend. So he died before the mending of the wound, and that's why the lesion is still there in the mummy, which means he was either wounded badly by hitting himself or somebody hitting him on the cheek, or maybe he fell, maybe he hit something. I thought maybe that can give us a lead towards probably he was hit by an axe or hit by a sword. Okay, sir, um, of course, um, celebrating the occasion um, is one important thing that uh, 
an opera written by Dr. Zehe Hawes was premiered in front of uh, the Habtusut Temple on November the 5th. How do you view this and how far would this opera contribute to increase the flow of tourists in Egypt? The opera of Tut Am Khiem and we are all awaiting it. It, it. it did not perform yet, so we are all awaiting the opera. Um, I'm awaiting the opera from not from the artistic point of view because I will leave that to the experts of the opera. But I'm awaiting to see the story. So, is the story going to be coming from the real texts, or is it going to be a drama? Are we going to dramatize the, the history of Tutankhamun and Nefertiti because Nefertiti is included? And are we going to add, uh, did, did Zahi and his friends in the opera added imaginary stories or are they going to deal only with what is in our hands as in Egyptology? And if you ask me, if I, if I was the decision maker, I wouldn't dramatize the opera. I wouldn't put drama. I wouldn't invent events. Why? Be because if you want to put some salt and pepper to make it attractive, well, the ancient Egyptians had their salt and pepper in everywhere, <laughs> okay? Our Egyptian history is in no need to salt and pepper. It is made out of all the delicious ingredients that you want. Two, we suffer badly from adding events. Take a look at the Nasser Salah Din movie. Take a look at uh, Arus and Nil. Somebody is thrown into the river. Never happened in ancient Egypt. So look at Kifah Tiba for Najib Mahfouz, very, very, very bad deal. So I am one of the people who are totally against novels writing history. History writes novels. Okay, sir, um, uh, celebrating this very important occasion, the Ministry of Antiquities and Tourism launched a campaign on its website and on various social media platforms. And so, uh, what is the significance and goals of this campaign? And how do you view the role of social media in promoting our destination? In the last couple of years, um, I'm, I'm really here saying good words about uh, the Minister of Antiquities and Tourism movement in the corridors of the internet, as I call it. They are performing in a very excellent way, I think. Uh, we are, I'm, I'm still sending them on the WhatsApp, uh, the, this word, the correct here, do this, do that. So I'm still giving them headaches and stuff, but they are receiving my words with respect. I believe that what they are doing on the internet is excellent for a good reason, because now we are in need to get to the younger generations and they are making it in a form of very attractive way and they are putting information good pictures good quality photography uh, so yes um, i think they are doing fine with the internet um, if i would add anything uh, to the internet is like for example here in the museum i have to say this because this is the first time i see it and i'm a tour guide since 1985 this museum i would move blindfolded i'm not gonna hit in my apartment, I would hit the table, but here I'm not. <laughs> so like I study this place like the back of my hand. Today when I entered, on the, and this is my advice to our viewers, our dear viewers, when you enter the Egyptian museum, take a look at your left hand side and you will find a, a big kind of screen. And this screen is showing you really interesting documentaries, very good documentaries, very quick documentaries. So it's not going to take a lot of your time. But what attracted me in these documentaries is a documentary about ancient Egyptian gloss and how gorgeous is the work and how gorgeous is the information I learned from that documentary and that's a successful documentary. If you are teaching somebody who's been reading history for 40 years and he wrote 55 books, so that's successful. So today, as we are recording this, I say Congratulations for those documentaries. The new show, the new exhibition. I've been searching for things that I found easily because of the new exhibition way.
Yeah, and then you'll see. Um, uh, Mr. Bassem, since you pinpointed on this when I uh, had this last interview with you on the 6th of October at the Air Force Museum, you told me you have to come and visit the Egyptian Museum because I'm going to tell you uh, a lot about this place. We're here at the Egyptian Museum. I was going to uh, ask this question at the end of the interview after finishing, of course, the occasion that we're celebrating, but you opened the top. So would you tell us what's uh, very special about this place other than the screen on the left? Yes, it is actually part of the celebration. So, yes, uh, thank you for asking this. If you give your back to the screen and look to your right-hand side, you will find a 2 meters, 22 centimeter high still uh, of stone, of limestone, white. Very obvious, you will see it, and the name and everything. It's coming from Komal Hisn in Bahira Governorate. And I considered it, and I'm still the most important text carved in the Egyptian museum out of those thousands of pieces here and in the storage rooms. And that's a pretty dangerous statement for me to say. <laughs> to say this is the most important text ever and all of this. Why? Because the text itself is showing us and telling us the for the first time the inauguration of the year being 365 days and quarter. T dating back to Ptolemy the third. So it's more ancient than the Rosetta Stila, which we are trying to regain from the British Museum. Because the Rosetta Stila is actually Ptolemy the fifth, but Komal Hust Stila, the Canopus decree. It's a decree made by the priests. And in this decree, Ptolemy III is being thanked for saving Egypt, he is the savior here, and all of this. But for me, the important thing is that sentence, which is mentioning that for the first time, because remember that the Julian calendar of Julius Caesar, and that's the calendaric system that the whole world used in a big scale. Then you have the Gregorian calendar of Father Gregory, which they call now AD. But who depend, I mean, what, what did you depend upon? Julius Caesar, the Romans, what did you depend on? Father Gregory, what did you depend upon? But what the age Egyptian kind? Well, what's your proof? My proof is one, two, three, four, and then voila, take a look at the state. So a couple of years, and I'm sending to the ministry, saying, please, 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 move the stila of Komal Hust from the room which very small number of people deal with, even though it was exhibited and described and everything in a very correct way, very correct manner. I move it to the, to the in front of the entrance, please. I was saying this thinking maybe they're gonna listen to my proposition 30%, 40%. To be amazed to have the reply on the spot, yes, it is in the new exhibition movement. And I was so happy, but I did not. You know, when you keep your happiness, you don't want to like explode and go and dancing in the street. Cross your fingers. <laughs> I cross my fingers. So um, that day I entered, I had a lecture to give here and voila, it's right in front of me, in front of the entrance, the main entrance and the only entrance of the Egyptian Museum, the Qom al husn Stila, the Canopus decree, the most important text in the Egyptian Museum. The Sharm el Sheikh Museum includes some of the uh, King uh, Tutankhamun's artifacts. How far would, King, uh, would the King treasures attract tourists who are seeking beaches? Yes, here is now, there are two schools dealing with this. A school would tell you we would put Tutankhamun in one place, like the big museum, and everybody goes to the big museum. Another school that says, let's put Tutankhamun in Sharm el Sheikh, let's put some Tutankhamun in Suhaj Museum, some beautiful museum in Suhaj, beautiful museum in Marsa Matruh, the museum in Hurgada. Alexander and so on and Luxor and and the military museum by the way it's going to be open when they are through with the preparations and this restorations and when is it due to be open actually we did not have a figure till now we didn't have a date till now but I'm awaiting this because it is an amazing building you see Egypt if, when you travel abroad and this is something for our dear viewers abroad as well they will know what I'm talking about to interrupt you, where is the uh, military museum? It's in the citadel of Salah al-Din. It's in the fortress of Salah al-Din itself, not far away from the mosque of Muhammad Ali. So, one thing we are a kind of unique about is that our museum buildings in Egypt, 
there are museums. So like this building we are filming in, nobody can actually touch a stone of the Egyptian museum in Tahrir Square. Why? Because it's over 100 years. So it is a monument itself. Everything which is over 100 years is a monument. So when you enter a museum, you are not only looking at the statues and the history, you are looking at the building itself. And that in the military museum is amazing. You will be so stunned by the stairs and the building. Very elite buildings. And that's Egypt. Egypt is an elite civilization. So take you back to your question. Are we gonna, for me, I'm the second school. I'm the school that would put it on Khiman in Sharm el-Sheikh, would put it here, put it here, put it there. Then we have two schools also about the flying museums. I call it the soaring museums, like soar like in flying. And that is when you take a, a, a number of statues or number of pieces, antiquities, artifacts, and take it to another country and show it. Now, two schools, they will tell you, bring the people to see it here. No, let the people see it there, and that will also be a good income to us, and it will be a good way of exhibiting our culture. So two schools, people believe this, people believe that. I, I'm in the second school as well. I am of, they are welcome here to see everything without us traveling there because I'm a little bit <laughs> like, I'm afraid something happens and, and this. But anyway, so we are here for example. I'll give you a good example for that. Two days ago, two days ago, 48 hours. And I've been years lecturing about the proto this is the importance of museums. The proto-synatic script. And many people, it's the proto-synatic script. It's an ancient script written and carved by miners and workers in Sinai. Near a place called Sarabit al-Khadim and other places. And on the river, not far away from the river Nile, in one place, two places like this. Very rare, but in Sinai we have a lot. Proto-Synatic script was studied at the beginning of the 20th century heavily by people like Flanders Petrie and Alan Gardner, oh, names, Alan Gardner in hieroglyphs. So they found out there are alphabet, 23 kind of drawings forming an alphabet. Now here comes a surprise. They noticed that the Proto-Synatic alphabet influenced the Phoenician in Lebanon alphabet. And we all know that the Phoenician alphabet influenced the Greek, and the Greek influenced the Latin, and the Latin influenced Europe, i.e., in one sentence I will end with this, the proto-synatic script taught Europe how to write the alphabet. Now, to prove that, we have a statue in this museum few steps away from where we're standing and it's in the new exhibition. So now a new exhibition for the good of studies and for the good of people who are looking for pieces that they didn't find for years. Mr. Bassem Shammah, is Shammah, with this final note, we thank you very much for this very intellectual, of course, and informative interview. Thank you very much for uh, your time, sir, and it's uh, our utmost, utmost pleasure. Thank you for having me and more of our beautiful civilization. Thank you, sir.